Let's do this. Dan Dugan is here. Yes. Uh! <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, Dan Dugan is here. That's right. I can't believe it. Anyway, I'm going to tell you more about Dan, but I first want to welcome you to the show. This is the Podcast Engineering Show. My name is Chris Curran. I produce podcasts for a lot of uh, bigger companies and medium companies and and individuals as well. And every week on this show, we bring you podcast production techniques on a silver platter. Really, we talk shop with podcast producers, audio engineers, and other specialists. I have a background in the music business, and since I entered podcasting about six years ago, I've noticed a huge lack of audio skills in podcasting. Well, and mostly because it's a hobbyist industry. It's, it's, it's hobbyists get into podcasting normally, not audio engineers. So anyway, that's where this show can help because... Uh, You can learn a lot, and if you implement the best of what you learn here, your podcast will sound a lot better, and you'll spend less time producing them, right? So sounding better as well as taking less time to produce. I mean, how (laughs) the time is probably more (laughs) almost uh, practically more important than, than the sound quality, but they're both important, right? So, of course, Barry is with me, as always, in studio. Yeah, oh yeah. And I just finished drinking my coffee, so I got to... Hold on, I got to cough. <coughs> yes! See, sometimes, uh, Dan, when you announce that you're going to cough, then you can leave it in. You don't have to edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Chris. Right. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, oh, I'm going to officially introduce you, Dan. Trust me. Okay. So, anyway, Podcast Engineering School. If you haven't heard of Podcast Engineering School, check out the website, podcastengineeringschool.com. The next uh, semester or the, the next batch is coming up in September. Check out the website for all the details. Uh, yeah, so let's let's do this. And I have to remember my three new, not new segments, the speed round I've, I've always done. And then you have the um, nightmare session. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Dan about a time when he was on a session that was just an absolute nightmare. And then I'm going to I'm at some point I'm going to ask him about what his next purchase might be, right? Cuz cuz you know, come on. Us audio people, we're always looking at gear, buying new gear and all that stuff. And I'm at the point when I actually have a little too much gear. I might <laughs> and I'm not sure how to get rid of it. Like I don't know if I should just like sell it on eBay or I've never used eBay. I don't I don't know how any of that stuff works. Anyway, I'll figure that out later. But Dan Dugan is here. This man has so much experience in audio, it's crazy. He's been active as an audio engineer since uh, the 60s, uh, and, and his website is dandugan.com. Got to check it out. He does a lot of nature recording, and he does sound design work, and he invented something called the auto mixer, which we're going to talk about, which I'm really interested to see how that auto mixer stacks up with, um, with like what Alphonic does and, and services like that. So that's going to be good. So let's welcome Mr. Dan Dugan. To the show. Welcome, Dan. <laughs> All right, hold on. I'm gonna fade the fade the cheering. All right. Wow, that was a quick fade. <laughs> so, welcome, Dan. Where where do you live, by the way? Where are you? I'm in San Francisco. San Francisco. All right. Sometimes when people say San Francisco, you know what I think of is when they were when that one earthquake was going on and the bridge was swaying back and forth and the guy was walking down the center of the bridge. <laughs> That's what I think of. Sometimes. So, which is <laughs> That's weird. Okay, sorry about that. So, Dan, seriously, you've been involved in audio since since the 60s, right? Uh yeah, I did my first uh professional job in 64, I think. Got paid to be the sound technician at the uh, Old Globe Theater in San Diego. Wow. All right. So, that was uh 8 years before I was born. So, I'm I'm really excited to talk with you. I love talking with people like you who have so much experience because I re- I value that, you know. I've worked with guys in the industry and girls in the industry who have a ton of experience and I really value that. So, I hope in this session we can talk about a lot of things, but I know it's it's not even going to scratch the surface of your entire story. So, um Well, um, I haven't but- I haven't had my coffee yet, but if you uh, if you trigger me, I can probably uh tell a story and uh if I forget where I am, you can uh, tell me where what the original question was. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, that's that's okay. You want you want to get some coffee, Dan? No, it's all right. Go ahead. Oh, okay. 
So, uh, yeah, you know, we are a coffee-friendly show. Um, anyway. Um, all right. So normally we start with the speed round. If it's a, someone who's, you know, recording podcasts or producing podcasts or hosting their own podcast, I normally go with them through uh, the speed round, which is for them to tell me uh, what they're using. So they're basically their signal chain. So let's do that with you right now, Dan, right now, because I know you're using a, a really good mic. What, let's talk about your signal chain right now. What mic you're talking into, where it's going into, and, and what kind of computer you have, and just, just briefly overview uh, the signal chain. Uh, well, I'm talking into a classic uh, Sennheiser 416, uh, which is the, um, the boom microphone on almost every movie uh, before, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, for, probably for a period over 40 years from the uh, 60s through the, uh, well, people are still using them, but that's a real classic. And uh, it's going into a, a Sound Devices uh, 788T, uh, which is an eight-track recorder, uh, hard drive recorder. Though actually, I've taken the hard drive out of it to make it use less battery. I'm recording onto the Compact Flash card, and uh, that's uh, that's a very simple chain right now. <laughs> right, right. And so, what um, what kind of computer do you have, Mac or PC? Oh, uh, it's a Mac. Uh, it's a uh, trash can uh, Mac Pro. Oh, the Mac Pro! I looked at those when I was going to buy a new Mac, and those are those are pretty powerful, right? Well, they don't have any of the regular, you know, type uh, accessory slots, but uh, it's worked great for me. I've I've had it since uh, I think the year when it came out. That's so interesting, calling it a trash can. I mean, literally, it looks like a tra- trash can without an opening on the top. All right. You got the Sennheiser 416. That's the shotgun mic that a lot of voiceovers use actually these days as well. And and it's a microphone I want. I I saw it on sale for 600 bucks and I didn't buy it and I kick myself every time I hear about it because it's normally about 1000. Um, yeah, well that's um, the nice things about, you know, classic microphones is they keep their value. So, you know, and and in terms of recording, you have to think of the microphone kind of like the camera lens, you know. The camera lenses cost more than the cameras do, uh, and that's there's a reason for that. You know, it's the most important part of the chain. So, uh, I highly recommend getting a, a really fine microphone. And if you, you know, if you change your hobby or something like that, you can you can sell it and uh, get good value out of it. Right, that's a great analogy. And then you're using the Sound Devices 788T. It's an interface and a recorder as well. H- how old is that unit? Well, it's not actually interfaced to the uh, to the computer. Oh. It's recording oh. independently, and then I'm going to send you the track to splice to uh, splice in. Got it. Got it. So it's a recorder. So lately, uh, sound devices. Well, I'm you're. We're going to talk about your field recording, and I'm sure you'll have probably have good things to say about sound devices. But um, so these days, they've come out with a few units called the Mix Pre Six and the Mix Pre Three, and all that, and it's. It's not only a recorder, but it's also an audio interface for the computer yes. as well. And it's like a mini mixer. You can do some mixing in it, you know, not not crazy amounts of mixing, but um, they're really, really awesome units. You you've been, you like sound devices throughout the years? Um, well, for a long time, I was kind of a casual dealer for sound devices, and now they're a licensee. Uh, they've got doing automatic mixing in a couple of their models. They, what is that they have on a couple of their models? They've got my invention uh, in in their model six thirty three and six eighty eight. Well, that's pretty cool. All right, so I think let's let's transition to that then. Let's talk let's talk about your invention. Hey, I, I want I, I have ideas to invent something, Dan. But I need I seriously, it's like I need I would need a lot of money, and I don't have time. So how how did you do it? Did you have the money or the time, or how did you invent this? Well, I didn't have any money, but I just worked away at it and uh, chipped away at it and uh, got something that was fantastic and then carried it around to manufacturers trying to find somebody to license it, uh, which took a couple of years, but uh, eventually did uh, find somebody to license, though it wasn't any of the good companies. Well, <laughs> though it, wasn't, it was the 10th company that I went to oh. that actually licensed it because uh, there's a lot of not invented here, maybe less nowadays than there was then back in the 70s, but I licensed it to Altec Lansing, which was the uh, sort of the general motors of audio, of professional audio back in that day. They, 
they've completely died now, but they built a version of it which barely worked, but uh, it was the only one of that nature on the market. You know, it was the first working automatic mixer. And so they sold a lot of them. And over the years, they did improve it, uh, though they never put they even, they never even put my name on it. But it uh, gradually got to where it almost worked really well. And then when the patent expired, that was when I started making my own. And I started making uh, automatic mixing controllers, which go in the insert point of uh, consoles. And uh, immediately it became kind of a secret weapon for uh, broadcasters and people who do staging, uh, you know, big events where they hire out the, they do the whole tech for the, you know, lighting and sound and staging companies called staging companies. And uh, they're heavy users of automatic mic mixing because there's often a panel discussion and broadcasters are a heavy user of automatic mic mixing because uh, panel discussions, uh, you know, are very common on broadcast. You know, I mean, news panels, sports panels, debates, and all that. Multiple microphones. Podcasting is generally one at a time, but if you even if you have two people, the automatic mixer can help. Right. You have no idea what so I'm talking. So- you have no idea what I'm talking about. I think. No, no, I do, I do. But, I mean, I want you to explain to us the, the just the mechanics of the auto, automatic mic mixer, the, just the idea that when there's several mics, let's say there's five mics, and then let's say it is a panel. T- tell us how the audio comes in and how the unit actually, dis- how, does it ride the volume of, of, of each mic? Well, it just uh, brings up the mic where the people are talking and turns down the other ones, which, you know, it sounds like something you would do with a noise gate, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and that was the first thing I tried uh, was noise gates. And um, the trouble with a noise gate is it has a fixed threshold. And when things are louder than the threshold, the mics come on. Well, if you set the, the threshold of a gate sensitive enough to handle the softer parts of speech or when people, you know, lean back a little or whatever, then when somebody talks loud – it would open all the microphones. Right. So, right. and then the system would go into feedback, you know. So, I found an algorithm which is called, now that the patent is, has expired, it's called gain sharing. And uh, it's really magical. Um, it takes the gain of one microphone and spreads it over the field of all the microphones. So, if you have five microphones, they each have one fifth of the gain. Um, and then when somebody talks, that gain is. <laughs> sucked to their microphone and the other ones are turned down. So now you've got the same amount of gain, but it's on the one microphone. Uh-huh. And so the room tone stays constant. You know, with, with gates, you hear the room tone popping off and on. Right. But right. Uh, with the uh, with gain sharing, it's always smooth. It just sounds like one mic. It sounds like you're handing one microphone around between different people, which is, you know, a perfect mix. That is really interesting. And so that's what's licensed into the sound devices 633 and 688. Yeah. You hear this on on TV all the time. Uh, All of ESPN sports commentary goes through uh, Dugans. They call it Dugans. Uh, Washington Week on PBS, uh, PBS NewsHour, whenever they have two or three people talking, uh, they use a Dugan. Uh, The Republican presidential debates, you know, you can remember the – the early presidential debate where they had nine people interrupting each other uh, and mm-hmm. subsequent debates, those were all done with Dugan. Um, so that's what it's used for, for uh, many people talking, and it's very good for podcasting. Right. So are, I was just about to ask, are any podcasters using this, or how would they use it? On what platform? Well, that's a good question. Um, I suppose they could use the sound devices, uh, mixer recorder. Right. And uh, because that's has it built in uh, to the mix down channels, the like the way those things work is they've got uh, like the 633, I think it has six input channels, uh, three mic inputs and three line inputs. And uh, it records uh, what in the movie industry is called ISO tracks, you know, so it records a separate track for each input, um, but then it also records a mix down you know, which uh, is usable for reference or for turning in what they call dailies in the movie industry. So you have the separate tracks plus the mix down, and the automatic mixer is on the mix down tracks. 
Got it. And it do- that's how it does the the gain sharing that you described. That's really cool. So on on platforms like we're using right now, we're we're using Squadcast, and of course there's Zencaster and Ringer, and there are some others, CleanFeed. I pretty much can say without knowing for sure that they do not use <laughs> the uh, yeah you know, your right. yeah your algorithm of gain sharing. So, but there's a company called Auphonic. I don't know if you've heard of them. No, they they do audio processing and they do several different things one thing is just leveling so they'll they if you if you upload a file they can level it to a certain loudness level the luffs yeah we're calling yeah. it luffs these days and they also have something where if if there's one let's say it's one mono track and there's two people speaking on it but one person is loud and the other person is soft Auphonic will sort of they say they use some ai or some machine learning to sort of level out the voices so it makes the 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 loud person and the softer person more even and it does a pretty good job actually um and then another thing they do is is called multi-track alphonic which is where it does if you you can feed it in let's say there's three speakers there's three tracks three different people and you can feed in the three tracks and it will sort of intelligently sort of gate the when someone's not speaking it'll gate their audio so it basically cleans it up so that's another that's it, that's similar but definitely probably not the same as as your gain sharing uh most likely yeah and you know my process is available for licensing <laughs> if any of those companies wanted to license it <laughs> but you know but generally there's fewer numbers of mics in podcasting but uh, the more mics you have the more important it becomes yeah well so podcasting is one thing where there's sometimes many mics but also now this uh, Live streaming, right? Online live streaming where platforms like Twitch and Mixer and others, even Facebook and Instagram live, they all have live, right? So, and now, so even I'm going to start streaming live and I'm going to have different guests connect with me on the live stream. So having something like your auto mixer in place to sort of balance all the mics would be, uh, would be really helpful. So yeah, now the auto mixer doesn't do any leveling. The mixing is, you know, is still done by the human in terms of that judgment, but it does do the uh, what I call the cueing, you know, the bringing up of the mic who's talking and the taking down of the others, and it does constantly crossfading. You know, it's doing perfect crossfades, so you don't hear it. Uh, it sounds just like one microphone. Right. Okay. So, so the engineer sets the levels, kind of like mixes the voices, so they're about the same level. And right. then the auto mixer does what you just said. Yeah. Brings said. people up and down. Yeah. Works the faders. Yeah. We just talked about a bunch of different companies that could use your algorithm. So it I, that'd be cool if uh, some of them reached out to you and asked you about it, right? <laughs> sure. That's cool. So let's move on to the nature recording. Well, l- let me ask you this. Is there anything about the auto mixer that we haven't really talked about that's worth sharing to... Uh, to podcast producers. Well, I, I can tell you, I t- tell you how it comes out. Uh, it's uh, I license a number of manufacturers. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is Yamaha, and there's Dugan Automatic Mixing in all of Yamaha's live digital mixers. So that's starting with the low budget uh, TF series that has eight channels in it, and then the uh, the QL series Yamaha mixers, uh, really fine con- little consoles. They've got 16 channels built in, uh, and then the CL series has uh, 16 channels built in, and they're really big uh, consoles, the uh, PM7 and the PM10, uh, you know, big concert consoles. Uh, they have 64 channels of, uh, of Dugan Automatic mixing in them. And then I make my own products. Oh, and, and, and there, I have other licensees to a company called uh, ProTech Audio in Indian Lake, New York, makes a, a, a low-cost version for installed sound, you know, churches and schools and things like that. Uh, not, not big music churches, simple little mixers. And let's see, uh, my mind is blanking now, too. <laughs> Sorry, I got several more questions for you <laughs> about this. Well, sound, about this. sound devices I mentioned. Right. Um, and then I make a whole series of black boxes, which I call automatic mixing controllers, which are multi-channel boxes that patch into the insert points of mixers. And so whatever console you have, if it has insert points, um, you can get a Dugan box and patch it in. And the reason there's seven different models 
is because it all depends on what uh, interface scheme you can use. So I have one that's uh, unbalanced analog. That's uh, like for simple little mixers like, say, a Mackie that has a tips end ring, re ring return insert jack. So that's the, uh, the E1A. That's unbalanced analog. And then I have a balanced analog, which is like for broadcasters who uh, have their inserts on a patch base, so they're all balanced. And then uh, I make an AES digital one. Uh, I was going to... <laughs> yeah, the dog's back. Yeah, the dog's back. And that sounded like a uh, like one of those wheels in Las Vegas when they spin the wheel and you bet on the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then I have one that's MADI. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that. M-A-D-I. It's a system for transmitting many channels. It's a, a single BNC connection that carries 64 channels. Uh, it's quite old, but it's it's an oldie but goodie from the early days of digital audio, and it's used in big broadcast plants for like you know connecting a studio on the fifth floor to the broadcast center on the seventh floor or something like that. They'll use Maddie, uh, and so I make one that connects by Maddie. Um, and then uh, most recently, I've got uh, one that connects by Dante. It's got 64 channels of Dante. Do you know what Dante is? Um, I've heard of it, but no, ex ex uh, tell me. Yeah, well, the big hot thing in, in audio now is um, an audio over network. Uh, you know, not necessarily the internet, but through local networks. Mm. And so, in, like, for example, if you're connecting to a stage box and you've got 40 mics on the stage, you can connect that stage box back to the mixer with one Cat5 or Cat6 cable. And uh, the audio is encoded onto the uh, onto the uh, IP, you know, the Internet Protocol system. And so Dante, there there are half a dozen popular systems for doing this. I mean, it'd be nice if there was just one, but <laughs> they're sort of getting established in different niches. And uh, Dante is uh, quite popular in live sound, uh, but also in uh, a lot of uh, plants where they have, uh, you know, like say an auditorium or a college theater or something like that, you put in Dante connectivity and you can connect anything anywhere. And it, it makes it easy to hook things up. There's a, you know, there's a program that you use for patching to organize the whole thing. And it's, you, have, you just have cross points and you just connect everything, anything to anything that you want. So uh, this is the latest rage in uh, audio engineering. Well, I'm really, really impressed and happy for you about all this work you've done with the auto mixer. I mean, well, you should uh, you should go to YouTube and uh, look up uh, Dugan Auto Mixer, and you'll find uh, dozens of uh, uh, short videos about how it works, and that you, know, you can see it demonstrated and um, learn how it works that way. Right, and so when you when it's licensed into these these other Yamaha mixers and the sound devices units is there there's like a within the unit itself or on the mixer there there's a is there's like an on off button for the for the Dugan auto mixing can you like take it off if you want to yeah yeah it's um uh, it's presented in most of them as an insert device so you actually have to patch it before it works uh so you patch it into the send and return from each channel uh preferably post fader and um and then uh, you have a screen that monitors it. You can see what it's doing. Oh, I see. So it's har it's hardware only. Is that correct? Um, well, no. There's actually I didn't mention it. Thanks for reminding me. There's a uh, I also license Waves, and Waves sells it as a plugin. Um, oh. Though it's not a standard Pro Tools plugin, it works in their platform called uh, Waves Rack. They make this platform, which is especially for handling many plugins you know say you have a you're doing a concert and you have an analog console but you want to use your waves digital plugins or something like that then you'd have an interface to an, ex, an auxiliary computer which would be running the uh, waves rack and then in the waves rack you can make these uh, many plugin chains that run all your favorite plugins on your live analog console so that you know there's lots of ways to use the waves rack and uh, there's a Dugan Auto Mixer plug-in for the Waves Rack. Got it. Oh, that's awesome. And so the Waves Rack, you can use that obviously in post-production, I'm sure. And then you, but you can also a lot of people are using that Waves Rack live. 
They're used live, and and, and also Waves makes a uh, a virtual mixer, what I call a glass mixer, called the LV1. Uh, it's a basically a big concert console, but there's no, uh, you know, it's all virtual. It's all in the computer with a touch screen. And Waves Rack has 64 channels of, of Dugan Auto Mixer built into it also. I mean, I mean, LV1 has Dugan Auto Mixer built into it also. Right, 64 channels, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So I, I now I need to play with this. I, now I want to like, you know, because because here's here's the thing: what happens in podcasting, Dan, is there'll be three or four people on a podcast, and oh, I want to. This is what I wanted to ask you. I remembered. All right. So if let's say we have five people on a podcast and we're using the the Dugan Auto Mixer, you know, in one way or another, right? Software or hardware or something. Good application, yeah. With right, five mics, right, it's really right, helpful. Right. Five mics. And so obviously, you know, usually one person will be speaking at a time. Uh, you know, there'll be some overlap, which is fine. And the, and the Dugan auto mixer can handle that easily, I'm sure. Uh, but here's, here's the thing that happens in podcast recording. There's five people. Inevitably, a few of the people don't understand that when they're not talking, they should be quiet. So that's the thing about podcasting. People don't understand mic technique. They don't understand that the fact that you, when you're recording, it's almost like you're in a recording studio and that everything you do is going to be picked up by the mic. So people yes. are like clicking pens and tapping their foot and, and you know, uh, putting their drinks down and stuff. So here, here's my question. With the Dugan Auto Mixer, what if someone really makes noise because by the way, gates don't help with that either. You know, the 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 clicking of a pen and stuff will come through a gate, obviously. So, what would the Dugan Auto Mixer do with this with this random noise that we don't want? It would it would obviously incorporate it, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, it will pick up uh, sounds that are at the other end, uh, interrupting sounds while somebody's talking. It's going to make it. It's going to lower them, but uh, if they're loud enough to be annoying, it, it it would probably pick them up too. So. The task of the operator becomes what looking for trouble, basically. You know, you don't have to mix anymore, but you do have to look for trouble and pull down the faders of somebody that's uh, making inappropriate noises. Interesting. Yeah, and that's why that's a lot of what I do in post-production for podcasts is like literally when people are not talking, I just delete, you know, I delete those parts of their track because... Yeah, clean know, it up. I clean it up and... Which is not a problem unless there's a lot of background noise on their track. Like if they if they're recording a podcast when like there's an air conditioner like five feet away and it's like shh, yeah. Then when they're talking, you hear shh in the background. But then when I cut out the parts where they're not talking, it's dead silent, and that that is weird. the The transition between those two is weird. Yeah. It's tough, man. I'm telling. It's tough. <laughs> it's tough dealing with people in audio who it's 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 like the raw tracks you get are not good. It's it's more that that's why the Isotope RX six uh, is so helpful. I don't know if you heard of that software. It's, yes, I have uh, that. I yeah. have that though. I, I rarely use it, but uh, it's yeah, a beautiful yeah. Tool. So for us podcast producers, that is, I mean, it's a lifesaver because de noise, de mouth click, de de hum. Every, you know, there's a million things in there. That's awesome. So that's... Yeah, I use that in my nature recording sometimes for taking out a generator. Oh. You can, you know, you can tune that in and the harmonics, you can tune in, the, you know, the hum and the harmonics and take, just take it out completely. So that's a good segue. Let's talk about nature recording. And, and this is one of the, well, one of the main reasons I wanted to speak with you about nature recording. Um, again, so... It's not directly related to podcasting, although it is because, um, you know, a lot of people do record podcasts on location and, you know, outdoors. So I want to talk about all that. My I, I've tried to record nature a few times with just, you know, just simple portable digital recorders like uh, my old Sony M10 or, you know, now the Zoom H6 that I have, you know. You know yeah, you know, those, little, those yeah. are good, the good recorders uh, for, uh, you know, simple handheld recording. Right. So when I do when I try to record nature like that because I'm into meditation and everything and I I had this idea of like 
uh, which I'm sure you do. And every everyone who records nature has this idea. It's like, oh, I want to really capture the nature well so that I can provide that audio to people or sell it to people and then they can listen in their home and they can feel relaxed and feel like they're in nature. But inevitably, there's an airplane that flies overhead, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, oh. the uh, a high altitude jet has a footprint uh, 30 miles wide. Wait, 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 what? what? Say that again? Well, when you're doing nature recording, you're almost always turning it up. So you hear a lot of stuff which ordinarily you would ignore. Right. Like the high altitude jet that goes over, you know, with the with a rumble that lasts for five minutes. Right. And that's that footprint is thirty miles wide. So I mean it's really hard to get away from those. Holy cow. I was trying to think like where I literally I was starting to look at maps and I I, <laughs> I literally searched for an, an airplane flight map of all the different airplane routes to just so I could find some place where there's no planes going overhead. <laughs> No, you're on it. No, that that's 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 what you have to do. But you know uh, what helps you is is the hour, uh, because a lot of the best recording is done uh, like the, what the, what we call the dawn chorus, when the birds wake up in the morning. There's a about a whole half hour, forty minute period when they they all sing, and um, that's the most beautiful time of the day for nature recording. And in summertime, that is uh, quite early, you know, that starts at like 4.15, 4.30 in the morning. Mm. So that's cool because the airplanes generally don't get up till six or so. I mean, there'll be, you know, there might be one or two uh, between 4.30 and six, but um, usually that's airplane free that early and that's what you gotta do. Got it. And so now if, there, if you are recording, let's say you're recording for an hour and it's awesome, and in the middle of that recording, there was a plane that went by and the plane lasted like five or eight minutes. Yeah. Can you, is it possible to edit that out and sort of stitch it together so it sounds like, so it doesn't well, sound like it's been edited? I have a friend who uses Isotope uh, RX for that and uh, does a beautiful job. I have a published uh, full length, uh, you know, CD length uh, Dawn Chorus from uh, Yosemite. And the guy used, there was one airplane in it and I, in my version of it, my, you know, my first draft, I just cut that out. And uh, he took the raw footage and he actually took it out with Isotope, you know, replacing the low frequencies in that section with a section where there was no airplane. Oh. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, I, I use Isotope and I'm not good enough to take out an airplane because it, you know, a jet comes way up in the spectrum, you know, as it's closer and then it it goes away to being just a low frequency rumble. Now, just a low frequency rumble, you can high pass, but uh, when it gets up into the you know higher end of the spectrum, that gets that gets harder. But with skill and with uh, Isotope RX, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So, so when you go in nature and you record nature, what uh, what microphones do you normally use? Well, I use a, a scientific protocol that's a you know a, a system that's the same every time. So. Basically, to give it scientific credibility, why scientific? Well, I get research permits from the national parks, which allow me to uh, to go in there and camp in places where camping's not allowed. And so, what I do is I go in and set up in the late afternoon in in my chosen location, and then I'll record in the evening. There's there's often, if in, especially in the spring, there'll be like an evening chorus uh, mm. as the sun's going down in the evening. The birds will uh, do a little singing. And then during the night, you know, I camp on the location. Uh, about I have a snake about 80 feet away from my mics. And that's really not far enough in a quiet location, by the way. If I, you know, if I turn over in the sleeping bag, you hear this right. from 80 right. feet away because it gets really, really quiet in a quiet forest or in the desert. And then I stand by during the night using the pre-record buffer that's on the recorders. Do you know what pre-record buffer is? Um, is that when it's sort of mono, like it'll, it's a pre, so when you hit record, it'll also record like the previous five seconds, even though you hadn't hit record. Is that what, is that Exactly, it? exactly. Okay. And with that, you know, if something happens in the night, if something goes bump, uh, coyotes start howling, uh, owls start calling, uh, then you just, 
you know, hit the record button and you've got it. I've recorded three falling trees uh, over the years uh, oh. using a pre-record buffer, uh, which is, you know, something <laughs> you wouldn't be able to get any other way. Totally. And on the on the 74, uh, 744T, if you're recording at 48K, it's got like an eight-second uh, pre-record buffer, which is just great. That's really wow. generous. That is and cool. it also has a has a physical remote control, a little switch box, a remote roll, as they call it in the movies. And so I've got that in the sleeping bag with me. And so, you know, I've got the headphones on or, or my – at night I usually change to my, uh, my ear pods, uh, earbuds. Uh, and so – because you can – roll over with those, you know. Right, right. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm there in the sleeping bag and I hear something happen and I've got my hand on the switch and so I just throw the switch and I can get it. Wow. So you asked me what kind of mics I use. Well, because I'm out all night and it gets damp often, you know, it gets mm. dewy, there's basically, you've got to use uh, the Sennheiser uh, MKH series microphones or some of the good Electrets, but... Uh, there, there are two problems in nature recording, and that is uh, humidity uh, and uh, self noise, uh, and these are both, uh, you know, specifications that for most kinds of recording, you know, for for popular music recording, neither of those are important. So you have a, a different class of microphones that you use because of these this need. Uh, the low self noise is because it gets very, very, very quiet. And uh, self-noise is the hiss that the microphone itself makes. So like a typical oh, lavalier mic might have like a 23 dBA uh, self-noise, which means that it's got a background noise level from the mic itself that's equivalent to a sound level of 23 dBA in the, in the space. And, you know, for regular speech, that's not a problem for sound reinforcement or something like that. But uh, when it gets really quiet, that does matter. Generally, nature recordists think that um, something that's better than maybe lower than 16 dBA starts to be quiet enough to record soundscapes. And I have, well, I have a heavy system and a light system. I can get into that. But my light system is electrets that uh, have about a 14 dBA uh, noise level, and that's adequate. But my real system, the really fine one that I want to take to the best, quietest places, uh, is down around 8 or 10, the, the, the Sennheiser uh, MKH series. And the reason uh, they have it, they use a different principle. They use the, they call, they're called RF condensers. Ordinary condensers are either electrets, which, you know, which cost less, or the, uh, the professional uh, condenser mics used in studios, uh, you know, that use a phantom power, they have a high voltage on the diaphragm. And if it gets humid, that starts to pop and fizz. Mm -hmm. So you can't, can't use your, your favorite uh, music recording mics out in nature because they'll pop and fizz uh, during the night. Mm -hmm. So the MKH series is what's called something Sennheiser invented called RF condenser. And uh, they don't use a high voltage polarized diaphragm they put a radio frequency on the diaphragm and it actually, when the diaphragm, you know, makes its microscopic movements, that uh, modulates the, uh, this radio frequency oscillator and then they demodulate that kind of like, uh, like receiving FM and they demodulate that in the microphone and it comes out as audio. But it's an entirely different principle than the regular condenser. And that saves your bacon in the field. Wow. And that actually their patents have expired. And there's now one other manufacturer that makes a, an RF condenser, and that's the company Rode uh, in Australia. Mm -hmm. They've got one short shotgun, which is RF condenser like the Sennheiser. That's fascinating. So if you are in the field with a regular, like, you said the MKH Sennheiser microphones have 8 to 10 dBA of self noise. When you're if you're in the field with a mic that has let's say 23 or 25 dB of self noise and you do crank up the mic preamp basically all the way, what what does that self noise actually sound like? Uh, it just sounds like electronic hiss. Okay. 
Well, it depends on the mic. Sometimes there's a grumble in there, too. But it's mostly his. And and when you're in the field, you really do need to turn up the gain all the way, right? Well, a lot. The sound devices recorders are actually calibrated. Uh, when you set the gain, you see how many dB the mic preamp is set to. And I use 55 for my MKH microphones. Another thing uh, for choosing microphones for nature recording is to to have hot output uh, because that gets over any hiss that comes from the preamp. Like, we can't use ribbon mics in nature because they require so much preamp. You know, you have to have a really quiet preamp and crank it way up when you're using a, a ribbon microphone. And that then you get hiss from the preamp in that case. Right, so it's best to use a mic with a really hot output so you don't have to preamp it as much. Yeah, high output, low self-noise, and... Um, insensitive to humidity that's the requirements right and and so the mkh is really a beast in 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 those regards right yeah those are lenses that you want to shoot with definitely and they come in all patterns you know so any any style of recording oh really the mkh series that comes in not only shotgun but other types of mics yeah they make cardioids and omnis i use all omnis my system is all omnis all right it's all omni you know what yeah, I didn't even think of that. But obviously, you would need an, an Omni. Or wait, so you use Omni, so it's 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 mono, it's one channel. Uh, no, no, uh, I record in surround. Uh, but most most nature recorders record stereo. But there's a, a, a coterie of a few people that, that are recording surround because I figure nature's all around. So right. you want to record surround sound, and it's it's very effective. So how many mics at, simultaneously are you recording? Well, my basic rig is four channels. I use a technique invented by a guy named Rich Pete on the uh, Nature Records uh, uh, message board. His technique is you basically use your favorite stereo array for the front channels. So that could be MS. It could be ORTF. Uh, it could be uh, XY. It could be spaced stereo mics, a, what we call AB. <clears throat> so there's four different ways that you could do your front mics depending on on your style and your choice i use a jekyll disc i didn't mention that there's another one jekyll disc uses a pair of omni mics ear spaced uh on a on a baffle a 12 inch uh, diameter uh round baffle with the mics on either side <clears throat> excuse me i haven't had my tea yet so i have a jekyll disc which is the front channels which is also very good on headphones uh, because it has ear-spaced microphones. So, uh, you know, that doesn't matter so much on speakers, but a lot of people are listening on headphones nowadays. So you'd like to have ear-spaced microphones because that gives you a real three-dimensional effect. Got it. That's the front channels. And, and when, I, when I make a stereo version of one of my recordings, I don't mix it down. I just use the front channels because that's a, a beautiful, uh, you know, all-around uh, way to hear it on headphones. And then I use a, an outrigger mic 40 feet away on the, to the left on the rear and another outrigger mic 40 feet away to the right on the rear, and those fill in the uh, left surround and right surround. Now, the front, the front pair is an imaging pair. You know, that's why I say it's your favorite stereo array. That gives you a, you know, a, a panorama of images between uh, left and right speakers. Uh, and then the rear speakers are far apart, and so they're what we call uncorrelated. And the, so those are diffuse, and they're, they're not an imaging pair. They just fill in. Now, there's other people who do surround outdoors with two imaging pairs, a front imaging pair and a rear imaging pair back-to-back. -back. Uh, that's another way to do it. But, you know, every recordist has their style. Uh, it's kind of like recording. It's, it's very similar to recording an orchestra in a hall. Mm, right. And then uh, we have a... Uh, we have a member, uh, Steve Sargent, who works at Dolby, who's been, uh, when I say a member, I'm, I'm talking about the Nature Sound Society. He's encouraging us to record surround, uh, and he also wants us to record height channels now for Dolby Atmos to give our, you know, our nature beds. They call ambient sounds beds in, uh, in the Atmos craft, and uh, he wants height mics also, and that's kind of really difficult because in an all omni system all the mics have to be spaced apart and so that means my 
my height mics, which are recording what happens above, uh, have to be like 14 or 16 feet up at least. And so uh, getting a stand arrangement that can do that is uh, challenging. But right. I, I've got one now that spaces the mics eight feet apart, uh, 16 feet up. Of course, that subsystem itself weighs 22 pounds. Oh. So it's, uh, that's why I call it the heavy system. You know, the heavy system weighs about about 30 pounds. Plus the height mics, you know, the four-channel system is 30 pounds, and then it's 52 pounds with the uh, – <laughs> so you can't backpack that. You know, I have, that's restricted to places where I can hike in, you know, half a mile or less, say. Mm. So your basic rig, the four channels, uh, in the front use a stereo array in a different pickup – sort of pickup patterns. You said MS, which is mid-side, right, I'm assuming? Yeah, a lot of the professional recordists, uh, like Bernie Krauss, for example, he uses MS. Uh, because it's very convenient in the field, it's uh, it's all in one package. Uh, do you know what that is? Yeah, the mid the mid side. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's it's all in one windscreen. Got they, it. they use a a cardioid, uh, an MKH forty, which is the cardioid, and then an MKH thirty, uh, which is a bidirectional makes up the MS pair. Got it. And so they call that an MKH 3040 MS array. Okay. I don't use that because the one point sounds fine on speakers, but you're missing the, you know, the ear distance in there for listening on headphones. So I like to have that ear distance in there. So that's why I use a Jekyll disc. Another one that has ear disc uh, distance in it is the uh, ORTF. Have you ever heard of that? TF. No. O R O four letters. O R T F. O R T F. No. Yeah, that's uh, the French radio standard way of recording uh, stereo, like you know, recording a, a school orchestra or something like that. It's two mics spaced ear distance apart, two cardioid mics, and diverting, uh, you know, going off to the left and the right about 110 degrees. Uh, you know, kind of like like X Y. X Y is a pair of of coincident crossed microphones that are at 90 degrees. Well, ORTF, the angle is 110 degrees, and they're spread apart uh, 17 centimeters apart. Uh, and that makes a very, uh, that makes a very nice um, stereo image on either speakers or headphones. Noises are happening now because my office manager, Don, has come in. <laughs> and okay. He's let the dog okay. out. He's letting the dog out. Because he doesn't doesn't know we're on the air. Okay. <laughs> so all right. So I I actually uh, we're getting toward the end here. But in terms of so you're recording these multi track recordings of nature, and then when you get back to the studio, just briefly, what's involved with the mixing of it there? I mean, if you have the two front channels and the two outrigger mics, you know, how do you mix them, or is it just by ear? You mix it till it sounds good to you. Uh, to you. I don't mix at all. Uh, I just edit. Uh, I record the mics at a calibrated level. You know, you have so much dynamic range available with a 24-bit recording that I found that I can use a single level for recording almost any soundscape. The only things that don't work are like thunder or uh, Pacific Chorus frogs up close. Just about anything else I can record with my 55 dB gain on the, uh, on the sound devices. And uh, so I never even adjust the level in the field. And when I'm playing back, you know, or, or post-producing, I may raise the gain to the whole, you know, the whole four-channel or six-channel array, but I don't do any mixing other than that. Uh, I just wow. edit out, you know, edit out airplanes and things like that. Got it. All right. Well, Dan Dugan, I'm so happy we got a chance to talk. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Folks can go to dandugan.com. You can see everything there. Um, hopefully, they can also maybe even purchase some of your nature recordings there. Is that right? Uh, yeah, there, there are a couple of recordings for sale, yeah. Well, Dan, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Well, it's been fun, Chris. Thanks for uh, for talking. Yeah, and I, and I speak for a lot of people in the audio industry. Thank you for everything you've done over your entire lifetime. All the advances in audio and all the expert advice and teaching is really helpful to all of us 
and especially even younger folks. So, so thank you for your contributions to, to the audio industry over the years. Well, you're welcome, and uh, I've still got new things coming. All right. Well, one, you got to do one last thing, uh, Dan. You have to yell. Well, yell. You can you can yell. Sound great. That's what we have to say as soon as this uh, this song we have here kicks in. <laughs> this is how we end it, Dan. You have to do it. Um, yeah. So just say sound great, and I'll I'll do it too. We're both going to yell it at the same time. And uh, this has been great, man. I we have to do this again. I have like. So much else I wanted to talk about and get into details with. But anyway, all right, we'll do it. But here's where you yell. Go ahead, Dan. Sound great! Okay, sound great. Oh, man! All right, that'll work perfect. You walk away from me, and you can't say that I'm so weird. What do you say?